Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the virtual Cup of Joe with your town manager, Paul Bachman, and special guest, Kat Newman, our new COVID ambassador coordinator. Did I say that right? Yep. Okay. And yeah. com <laughs> community liaison officer, uh, Bill Laramie, and his partner, Winston, are also on the call. So good morning, everybody, and welcome. Morning. 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 So I just want to remind the room that we are going to hear from our guests, ask some questions. Um, you're also welcome at any point to raise your hand in Zoom or press by pressing star nine if you're joining us from a phone. We also have the Q&A function if you want to pop a question into the room but don't necessarily want to chat with us live, feel free to do that. So I'm going to just hand it over to Town Manager Paul Balkaman to, to welcome everybody and give any updates he has. Hi, everybody. So we really want to get to our guests, which we appreciate you coming out to be here with your, your compatriots, uh, Winston there, Bill. Um, so a lot going on in town. Um, we're, we are, are at a good steady state, I think, for that this moment in time. And um, town offices are moving forward on all the activities that we've been doing. Uh, people are pretty much uh, um, all the things that you would expect to be receiving from town uh, hall and the services are out there being provided on a regular basis. So I um, really don't have a whole lot more than that, but I think things will come up. I'd rather there's a good number of people in the audience that so we'd like to hear from them. Absolutely. And I think um, we've got two semi new teammates here um, joining mm -hmm. us. Um, Bill has been a guest in the past on our community chats. And we have Winston joining him now as well as Kat who has joined our team. So I'd, I'd love to give um, Kat Newman a chance to tell you a little bit about herself and her background, her work history, and, and how the first few weeks in the new program are going. Sure, thank you. Um, so a little bit about me. Currently, I'm starting, almost starting my fourth week in this role um, through the town, and I wear two different hats at the same time. So I work as the town program ambassador coordinator, and then I also work um, over at UMass at the off-campus student center under Sally Lenowski. Um, and there I run the Walk This Way and the Team Positive Presence program. So that came out of when I was a graduate assistant over at UMass, um, and I'm starting my fourth year in that program, which is exciting because now I'm seeing some of the first year students becoming mm -hmm. seniors. Um, a little bit about my background in terms of my history. Um, I'm originally from Reno, Nevada. I came out this way to study gender studies in Mount Holyoke. I was a, a excuse me, gender studies in Spanish at Mount Holyoke. I was a double major there and then decided to stay in the Valley. Um, worked for a while in psychosocial rehabilitation. So in a clubhouse setting with adults with major mental illness for reintegrating folks back into the community. So I worked in housing supports and membership services and ran a transition age youth program there. And then I transitioned over and I worked as an LGBTQ program specialist at a nonprofit. Um, the nature of nonprofit, you wear many different hats at different times. So I did a lot with Workforce Investment Act folks and was a green energy liaison for a little bit, ran a trans rights education and empowerment program um, in Franklin and Hampshire County. A lot of that was looking at sort of safer sex education, harm risk reduction, suicide prevention, um, all using sort of the positive youth development model and youth leadership um, is sort of infused um, without, throughout all of that. And it's important in a lot of my work. Um, after that, I worked in admissions for a short while. Um, so traveled and that's sort of the way I got my head and my foot in the, uh, the door in higher ed. Um, worked there um, and then ended up at UMass. Um, and when I met Dean Lenowski, uh, when I met Sally, I sort of said, I don't want to be overzealous, but this is amazing work and you're doing amazing stuff. And if you don't hire me, I mean, I'd really like to work for you, but if you don't <laughs> hire me, um, can I come back and sort of pick your brain? Um, because I was really interested in how sort of the trajectory that she came up, the work that she was doing, community work is really important to me. Um, and luckily she, she chose me and, and kept me for a while. Um, so I just finished a master's degree um, at UMass um, in social justice education. So it's kind of how I got here. Is that it? That's it? <laughs> that's that's it. a phenomenal journey. Yes, that, that, that's a really deep history yeah. and I, that really gives context to your current work. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I, yeah, I wanna give, give Bill a chance to introduce his new partner too and say a little bit about that program. Um, and while we do that, I just wanna remind the room, feel free to raise your hand, press star nine from a phone or pop a Q and A into the, to the Q and A chat so that we can get your questions asked. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I can tell you right off the bat, Winston's resume is not quite that impressive. <laughs> um, he's only been alive for nine weeks. So that's, <laughs> and as you can see now he's drifted into his first nap of the morning. But so Winston joined us September 10th. He was sworn in. Uh, he comes from a breeder up in Ringe, New Hampshire, who's really dedicated to providing dogs that are service oriented. So his Ultimately, he's going to become, as you can see now, he's already fulfilled that role as a comfort dog. Uh, and what that means essentially is at a basic level, he's doing what he's doing right now is providing comfort to me. And, you know, when he wakes up, he's going to go out and intermingle with our officers and with the community as much as he's able, given his age. And then he's over the course of the next year and a half, he'll be trained to work in a role to identify you know, it's, as an example, if we conduct a sensitive case investigation, he'll be able to say it involves children or something. So he'll be able to interact with children. There'll be that immediate connection. And that's really something we are hungry for right now in this profession is creating connections non-traditionally. And, you know, as I started to look at this program, I thought this is the perfect time in the perfect community to, to pitch this. And the fact that he was donated made it easy an easier sell to my chief of police. So, and he's been nothing but a hit here so far. You know, it's like I was saying to Brianna before we jumped on here, and you know, I'm pretty much nobody now. I put him on the floor in the morning, people ignore me and they just flock to him. So we're excited to see him grow and develop his skills and kind of become the best version of himself to, you know, reflect our department and, and serve the community. So. We're excited about it, but it is admittedly a lot of work. It's been a long time since I've had a, a newborn. My, my black lab is nine and my youngest child is 17. So this is a crash course and being a parent of an infant again, but again, it's been fun. It's worth it. So Bill, we got a request from Heather. If you could lower the camera a bit to show more of Winston. Sure. And I, and I know you're sensitive to this right now, but um, people want to see. <laughs> oh, oh Bill, there we go. Oh, God almighty. Um, Bill, uh, it's not just Winston being a dog. It actually, you actually go through training. You get trained and, the, and Winston gets trained to learn to be a comfort dog. Is that right? Exactly. I, I think really the training is more for the, the handler than it is for the dog in some sense, you know, he's gonna learn basic commands, but it's about me, him and I reading each other's body language. You know, there could be situations where he's uncomfortable, where he's fatigued. So kind of understanding that, so it's really, but I can tell you already, like the connection we have is, is pretty significant. As an example, yesterday, left him in the operations here, the PD, and I'm kind of physically disconnected. I'm in a different part of the building. I came back and he was standing by the door, like looking through the window, like, where did you go? So, uh, yeah, he's getting plenty of early socialization, which is important to his development. I mean, I took him out yesterday briefly with, with Kat and some of the COVID ambassadors. We did some community outreach and unfortunately, or fortunately is to him is most of the time he's carried and most of the time he's doing what he's doing now. So it becomes some pretty significant weight. So he's gonna have to learn some uh, leash discipline here pretty quick. Otherwise he'll be staying in the office. But yeah, so that's pretty much, it'll probably be about a year and a half before he is at a level where, you know, he can integrate into most situations. I can hear him snoring. I don't know if anyone else can, but that's very yes. sweet. <laughs> um, I love that he, you mentioned that Winston's going to be helping doing outreach and has been working with the COVID ambassadors. I, I wonder if um, you or Kat can talk a little bit about, uh, for the folks who aren't 100% sure what the program is about, just give a little introduction to, to what the work you're doing. Sure. Bill, do you want me to take that or would you like to speak first? Yeah. Uh, Okay. Um, so a little bit about the program. Um, so as many folks know, there's a mask ordinance in the downtown area and the surrounding streets that extends in through the university. Um, and so what our COVID ambassadors are hired to do are to simply sort of 
be a friendly face and a resource in town. Um, they're not the mask police, even though we are sort of housed um, very graciously through the, the PD. Um, but they essentially, you know, they walk around on the street and if they see somebody without a mask, they offer them a mask. Um, and also if anybody has any questions or things like that, they help with education around that. Um, it's really common. We see um, yesterday, Bill mentioned we were out in the um, in the community. And so part of the interview process now is what we do is we invite folks in for an interview and then we actually bring them out in the field so they can kind of see what that looks like. Um, that's something that has developed over time from running the Walk This Way program because a lot of times folks will hear something about a program, hear a job, and they're like, wow, that sounds really great. And then they go out and they do it and they're like, yeah, walking for a couple hours is not for me. Or talking to folks like I prefer to be behind a computer or whatever it is. So it's a way for people to kind of test to see if the job is a good fit for them, um, as well as get to sort of see how they'll jive with our current staff members. Um, and we had some folks yesterday that asked questions about, you know, if somebody's coming and coming up on a street and they're running by and what are things you can do and ways to stay safe. And it was really great to kind of watch sort of the collaborative effort of ambassadors sort of respond to that folks. And it was really nice. One of our new applicants, um, bumped into three of his former teachers from kindergarten through fifth grade out on the out on the street. Um, so it's been kind of fun. But you'll see folks mostly in the downtown area. Um, what we're starting to do is a lot of door to door outreach as well. So Bill talked about, you know, creating connection in non traditional ways. And I think now the pandemic more than ever has highlighted the need for connection and um, the importance of connection. So a lot of what we'll do is we'll go around and we'll sort of knock on folks door and we'll just sort of let them know that we're there, we're a resource, we exist. We ask how, you know, folks are doing. Um, I think saying to folks, especially like now, uh, times like now in the pandemic, saying to somebody, you matter, we see you, goes a really long way. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of data and different collections that happens. And I'm happy to speak to that at a little, um, in a little bit, if folks have questions about that. But um, a lot of times people in the same way that the Walk This Way program, right, is running usually 10 p.m. to 1 a.m., permanent residents don't often see those folks doing that work. Um, so that's why we're also going door to door because you may, meet, may miss the ambassadors if you're, you know, walking through town and you don't see a yellow shirt. They're all in very bright I am Amherst shirts, um, you know, and so we're kind of doing that door to door outreach to, to let folks know that we're there. <clears throat> Bill, do you have anything to add about your 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 piece of this in the uh, outreach? Yeah, in terms of how we integrate. So Kat comes to us, I think partially recommended by me. I mean, she's done some terrific work over it over at the university. So she kind of hit the ground running. I'm just kind of here to to guide her, to get her to understand how our PD works, how our community works, and you know, she She's done a terrific job thus far. And, you know, in terms of the outreach, that is a significant piece. It's something we, we've done for a while. And it used to be, you know, it'd be Tony and I or John and I. And then, you know, I'm like, why don't we incorporate students into this? This peer to peer interaction is really significant. It kind of sets the tone. So we've kind of been able to step away a little bit physically in terms of interactions with students we can answer technical questions and of course we do our introductions and stuff but it's nice to see the peer-to-peer -peer stuff and then really in this time it's it's nice to see students appreciative of us being there not only the message we're delivering but the fact that they're having some face-to-face -face interaction with someone other than people whom they live with you know it's just you can see it in their face and of course you know, having Winston, it does help set the tone. I mean, puppies tend to do that. So that's been a terrific piece too. So yeah, I think, I think we're in a good place. Overwhelmingly, we're in the work that I do outside of supporting Kat and her work. Overwhelmingly, we're seeing students who want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. You know, people are concerned about size of gatherings and you know, opportunities to, to spread the virus. But in a lot of our response, follow up responses to some of the concerns of the community, again, we're seeing cooperation really at all levels to include size of gatherings. You know, there's been a couple of hiccups where, you know, we've seen houses with, with 30 or greater people, but for the most part, 
you know, kind of 10 to 15 has been our benchmark and we document that in our responses. Like it's important to me to share that with our property managers and landlords, but it's also in this time, it's good to know that, you know, people are, are doing their part. Yeah, it's, it's also been really interesting just to echo that piece about the solution, you know, students in particular wanting to be a part of the solution, not the problem. It's been really fun to sit in on interviews. Um, I've interviewed about, um, by the close of next week, I'll have completed 23 interviews. Um, and we have an, a current ambassador sitting in on those interviews with us who's helping sort of orient and get folks um, settled. And it's been really nice to hear what attracts people to this work. And um, even then when they do their first outreach shift, they're like, wow, the community is so rich here. We, we really wanted to get to know our community better. Um, and that's an exciting, I think, point and, and different from a couple years back, right, of how the town and the university and how the interactions happen. And so it's, um, you know, I feel like to watch a shadow shift happen and have an ambassador sort of walk leaving with a friend and saying that was so fun like you know and having them talk about you know we interacted with some older residents yesterday and they just really enjoyed talking to them and stuff so it's um it's been really really neat and i think the the collaborative um partnership is so integral and so essential to this um to this work it's allowed me to to start a program essentially in three days um which has been pretty impressive so a big shout out to to all the folks in the town and at the university. And I think what's also really interesting is um, we're having to get really creative, right? So in the same way, like, you know, Bill spoke to my experience, I know how to run a program like Walk This Way, that's pretty easy, but I haven't done that in a pandemic. So having to get creative about that has been really interesting. And so what's been really cool too is watching sort of the, the cross collaboration and almost cross pollination of um, of knowledge and of care that's happening. Um, so for example, um, some of my team leaders, I have about 15 students that I'm working with over at UMass for Team Positive Presence and Walk This Way. And we have a couple of folks who are in person. And normally every year with Walk This Way, we've sort of fine tuned and developed the training for the onboarding for students. And I worked really closely with folks from FIRE with Inspection and Bill, and we do a really you know, a three day sort of um, team bonding experience. And we do a block on, in particular, on crime prevention through environmental design um, through SEPTED. And what's been really cool is some of our team leaders for Walk This Way have said, oh, we're gonna take our new hires um, on Sunday. I'm gonna do a walking tour and show them crime prevention through environmental design in the neighborhood. And then they said, and then I'm gonna run a night shift where they can see how different the environment is at night. And so, um, what's been really helpful in, in terms of also sharing resources, you know, so we're going to be starting tabling um, for ambassadors. So you'll see us, we're going to, um, you know, I think everybody at this point is sort of aware of six feet apart, wear your mask, things like that. And to some extent, I think a lot of people are almost experiencing mask fatigue. And so we're coming up with creative ways to do that. So um, we offer plain white masks to folks in town. Our ambassadors are gonna be running some stations where you can go and tie dye your mask, for example, um, in a safe and distanced way. Um, but our, our team positive presence folks are gonna be hosting um, sort of an orientation for our ambassadors today on how to run tabling and then working with some of the work that they're doing, we're in the process over at UMass building something called the Peer Health Ambassador Network, which is supporting UMass students around health and well-being, um, all around you know, COVID safety. And so our entry point for Walk This Way is sort of you know, reducing high-risk drinking, but masked obviously overall in health and well-being. And um, our ambassadors then are gonna say, oh, so we can use your spinning wheel, but we're gonna change all of the sort of prompts and ways to interact with people to be COVID-19 related. Um, so it's really cool to sort of, I think not only see the collaboration from the town and university level, but also like as somebody who comes from youth development and leadership, that's something that's infused with all my work. It's really cool to watch young people sort of really taking you know, the lead and the control in that, in that way. Um, and I do also wanna point out that we don't just have college students, like this is an intergenerational issue and the, you know, the peer to peer is so important. Um, so a lot of times I get questions of, can I be an ambassador? And like, if you're a retired person and you, you have some time on your hands, come, come to me. I would love to field you out in a yellow shirt and, you know, have you talk to other retired folks, right? Cause that's gonna land differently than maybe a college student. Um, so there's a, there's a need for everybody. It's a community effort in that regard. I think it's, it's so clear. We're so fortunate to have you um, pick this up 
Kat. I think you said you spun up a program in, you know, in three days. I don't think anybody else could have done that because of your connections, your experience, what you brought brought to the table. And it was like stunning to me how you were like interviewing people within days. You were, you know, you had people on the streets. I mean, you have people at the farmer's market, you know, they're just to interact with folks, let people know that they're, you're there. So you've done it on so many different levels. I really appreciate the work and the energy you brought to making this happen. It, it's, and we've gotten so much positive feedback on the town. You know, we have a COVID hotline people call and many times they'll say, we appreciate that you, that you have people out there doing that. And the, for the town orientation, it's a lot of it is the, the students, but we also know that it's not, there's gatherings all over the place. There's lots of people who are, we are edu interacting with. And, you know, for the town's point of view, it's, um, we also are addressing um, sort of gatherings at Mill River, at Groff Park, things like that, um, with, with similar types of groupings um, and trying to help people. Ed and again, it's the education and creating a culture of compliance. And those are the two things that, that we really lead with because that's sustainable, it's more impactful and it's, uh, it's something that's gonna last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we are always as good as our teammates, right? And I, mm -hmm. think, uh, I think we have a really impressive team. I was, that's why I was able to do that work. And I think in the same way, um, we see overall, we see a ton of mask compliance in the downtown area. So I think, right, every time that you put your mask on and it's not only a protection for you and others, but it's also helping create that culture and set that tone. Yes. So. See, um, I see a hand from Diana. So I'm going to allow them in. So Diana, if you could just introduce yourself. You might have to unmute your mic. Actually, it's uh, Paul Peely. I'm sorry. It's um, sorry, uh, Paul. Welcome. It's, it's okay. Um, I don't know how to change the name setting, um, but I just wanted to know how to sign up for this and what is the minimum minimum commitment. Sure. Um, so currently there's an application that's listed on the town website. Um, and you can, even if you just sort of Google, you know, Amherst COVID ambassador, it's what'll come up under the, the job openings. Um, and the minimum requirements is that you want to make a difference in your community. Um, I, I really believe that, like when I approach my work, my praxis is that relationships and connection are at the, at sort of the helm of that. And I think that really anybody can create connection. So if you're interested in doing that, you can be qualified. Um, and really what I do, I'm really accustomed to working with students. So their schedule changes every semester. Um, so in terms of minimum sort of requirements for the program, you're able to work up to 19 hours a week. Um, but if you had five hours available and you wanted to do that, I'll work with that. Like, I think it's really important to meet people where they're at. And, you know, we, we love to hear from, from folks like you, Paul, in that regard of, wanting to make a difference. So definitely come and send me an application. Um, and if you, you're having trouble navigating it on the website, um, you know, we can, we can work with that too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your question, Paul. And you can find that at amherstma.gov slash jobs or send, send one of us um, an email and we'll get you connected to Kat. You can email info at amherstma.gov if that's easier. All right, so if I see- If you can't do any of that and you wanna stop in the police station, I can also, um, I'm there many days as is Bill, so we can kind of help you navigate it that way too. If that's helpful. Lots of options. So we have a hand mm -hmm. from Jeff. Jeff, if you want to unmute and introduce yourself, please. Hi, this is Jeff Lee. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hey, Jeff. Hi. Um, I, Read on the uh, UMass COVID-19 uh, dashboard that Tuesday there were four new cases, and this was after more than a month of zero or one cases every day, and nothing's been reported since September 22nd. So I was wondering if this is a cause for concern or possible outbreak. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm not, I don't know. We, we have a meeting at 10 o'clock with our core team, so I'll, I'll learn anything happening there. I mean, I think what we should expect. I mean, we've, we've had inordinately low numbers for COVID positive tests um, and we're doing a lot of testing. We are the fourth largest testing site in uh, Massachusetts. The only cities bigger than us are Boston, Worcester, Cambridge, and then Amherst. So we're doing a tremendous number of testing. The kudos to the university for this testing. 
uh, system that they st stood up and it's really working really well. Um, they're testing symptomatic and asymptomatic folks. We would expect, and we had anticipated, I thought this was gonna happen weeks ago, if there was gonna be something that, you know, we would, we would anticipate there was gonna be some kind of um, um, increase or something along the way. And, you know, it, you know, it was, it's been sort of astounding to us that nothing has happened, you know, that with the number of people we have and the kind of fluidity we have in our community at some point, you know, if it, it's going to, something's gonna pop up, I would assume. Um, we hope that it doesn't, we don't expect anything will, but, um, you know, but I, because I think we, we have a very robust testing schedule going on and, but, you know, we do have people who in our community who travel, um, have family who travel to different places. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, we have to be vigilant about that. And we want to continue to work on, on that. So I don't know, you know, I have, I have not looked at the university's website for a while, so I don't know what the status of that is. Um, but we usually, I usually get an update on Friday mornings from our health director, so. Okay. Thank you. And I will just add to, um, from, the, from the visibility and outreach standpoint, we've done a lot of, you know, door knocking. And one of the messages that we always do to folks is say, you know, we, we talk about, you know, keeping your gathering small. We talk about ways to keep safe. And we always ask, you know, if we're doing student um, sort of outreach, we always ask, have you been tested? And um, UMass students are tested on campus um, twice a week, as well as off campus students. And I know I haven't checked the dashboard. I like to look at it every morning, Paul, but I know as of yesterday, there were about 50,000 tests that have been conducted yeah. so far. So it is like the amount, the volume that's coming out is pretty impressive. Um, but we are yeah. also having those conversations in the community and reminding folks. Um, and so I just say that Jeff is like, um, you know, I think when we see an uptick, it can be kind of concerning, but overall, and Bill, you can echo this too. I think that every student we've talked to, we, I haven't actually encountered a student who hasn't been tested in the last couple of weeks. So, you know, the, the other thing about that is I, I haven't seen, and I looked at my own kids for this too, is that everybody's like, sure, why wouldn't I get a test? You know, it's sort of like, yeah, if it's available and I don't have to pay for it. And that's the, the fact that the university opening the, opened the testing to anybody who lives in the area was really appreciative of that because I think that was really key to um, having sort of as much ubiquitous testing as we can. And, you know, again, we'd like to open up to all members of our community that you can get a test whenever you need it. Um, I'm working really hard on that because I think we will, I anticipate a lot of people traveling during, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, holiday, holiday seasons and um, people before they travel or when someone comes to Amherst, they want to get a test. And um, so I, uh, it's, so I think that, you know, trying to make sure that there is testing available to people in the town of Amherst is one of our, our big priorities right now. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'll just take this quick chance to remind any new um, attendees who've joined us, feel free to raise your hand to come into the room and ask your question or use the Q&A function. Um, and I can ask your question on your behalf. So I, I have a couple of questions that we, oh, actually, here's Paul again. So Paul, just unmute. Um, yes, did I just hear you say that, um, uh, community people can get tested for free at UMass, or did I misinterpret that? No, I, I may have misspoke, Paul. No, community people cannot get tested for free at UMass. Uh, it's just for UMass students and staff. <clears throat> and they have, and the reason for that is there's a limited capacity that the university has in terms of supplies and all those types of things and what they've contracted for. What we are working with um, is looking for um, another venue to be able to offer tests to people. I think you can get tests. That's a frequent question we get on our COVID hotline. Where can I get a test? Holyoke, I think, is the closest uh, location at this point for a free test. And it's a drive-through um, situation there. And there's, I think, maybe West Springfield might have another location uh, with our state rep and state senator. We're advocating to having a testing site located in Hampshire County, at least. But, you know, we're, and we've offered to host one in Amherst. So no, it's, you. yeah, UMass is not open to the pub to the general public, but we're working on that piece. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So I have um, some questions here that we've been kind of getting throughout 
you know, the last couple of weeks with the program um, and the COVID hotline. So what's the connection between COVID ambassadors and complaints that come in to the, um, the hotline or via email to the, to the town? Can, can someone talk a little bit about that? Sure. Bill, do you want to speak? I've just been doing a lot yeah. of talking. So do you want to speak first and I can add in? Sure. I can discuss that a little bit. So I have, in terms of the complaints that are coming in, I do have access to those. And kind of what I do in reviewing those is determine, you know, what is the best fit. Angela Mills up in Town Hall will, will document who she's forwarded that along to. So I will look at that and say there's, you know, some type of complaint about large gatherings, unmasked people, not social distancing, concerns of overpopulation. So I would look at that and say, okay, that is, the, at some level it is a, a three-pronged approach. It could involve the police, it could involve code enforcement and our health inspector, and it could involve the COVID ambassadors. So what I'll do is, you know, sometimes I will email CAD or we'll have a face-to-face -face discussion about, okay, here's here's a place I think we should go, or here's a hot spot based upon some of our call activity. Like, for example, last week, we saw an upward trend in activity over in like the High Street, Gray Street, South Whitney area. So I said, let's when we do our outreach, that we did it last Friday, when we do our outreach, I want to focus on that specific neighborhood. So we went over there, distributed welcome packets, kind of discussed with students the expectations we have of them as, as a police department, you know, concerns around large gatherings, stuff like that. So that is how we kind of comb through that, that data and decide what is something that requires follow-up further follow-up. It seems as though everything is followed up on either with a phone call, but then I'm kind of circling back to see what would require an in-person follow-up or maybe a connection with a property manager or landlord. So there's a lot of a lot of moving parts and a lot of different people involved in trying to create a, a solution to the, the concern of the community. Yeah, it's all about sort of that prevention and postvention follow-up. Um, and we're going to be also switching over um, to have ambassadors in the next couple of, um, hopefully by next weekend, but don't hold me to that because we're still building the program. Um, but on the weekend hours, we're going to hopefully have an ambassador be staffing the COVID line as well. Um, and they'll just be sort of logging the calls um, because we talked again about connection, right? And if you see something and you're feeling nervous, to be able to talk to somebody and have them sort of log that and then it goes into our system that we have created um, versus leaving a message, um, we're gonna start doing that. Um, and it'll be for limited hours, but that'll also, you know, kind of help Bill um, kind of sift through those as well. I think the community members who've been using the hotline would have appreciate that and we, we, we do see the trend coming you know Friday afternoon and into the weekend is when we get the bulk of our um, communications from folks so I think I think people can look forward to that and I yeah. always put the plug in for if you oh sorry go ahead Bill and that that was something we identified and I discussed it with the chief of police like I think it makes sense to have a man dedicated to answering those calls because there's nothing worse than you know being in a moment of uncertainty or fear and you call and you get a voicemail so we're going to work hard the next week to try to get this up and running and plug some people into them and mm -hmm. and train them on you know what to discuss and what the appropriate referral is so yeah mm -hmm. that's we're shooting for next friday we'll see fingers crossed <laughs> we'll let everybody know we'll, right. once, once it's once it's settled I have a question, just jumping off what you said, Bill, for training. Um, I, I've had a few questions. Are the COVID ambassadors specifically trained in any um, certain areas before starting or as part of the onboarding process? Uh, to, to what extent in terms of how to it's, communication skills or? Yeah, geographic? just public health protocols, anything, anything that would help um, their work? Is, is there a, an onboarding process and what does that look like? So I'll speak a little bit to what we do in terms of the police. So we've conducted one orientation with our first group of hires. And really from the police perspective, it's about visibility, making connections, but also under, understand the intersection you're going to 
you're going to run into some people in our community who are they're simply not going to wear a mask and it's not your job to try to coax them to wearing a mask to get in a confrontation with them it stops with giving them some education offering them a mask if they say no that's where it ends we're not in the business of creating confrontations you know safety is our number one concern your personal safety but also in terms of public health so that's kind of what we're we are doing initially I do think there's going to be some additional training once you know our staff is really up and like I think once we have a, an established team then we're going to offer like some de-escalation training and uh, I know Kat's got some, I, some other ideas that she can speak about but so yeah we're going to be as the program evolves so does the training but at the very basic level when we do our our orientation with our newest hires that's kind of what we discuss and what we go through yeah that's a bit of why we um chain you know the orientation process includes that shadow shift for two hours and we get to work with folks in the community so they kind of get to hear um you know modeling is a really helpful tool i think for orientation purposes and onboarding purposes so they get to hear both sort of folks like bill or Tony Marulis or John Thompson or Ed Smith or Salonowski. We had Betsy Krakow out with us last week from the university. Um, so they get to hear sort of those conversations. And then they also get to hear, um, you know, staff who have been doing this type of work, either if they're Walk This Way students coming out on behalf of the Peer Health Ambassador Network um, or other ambassadors. So we'll sort of work with them, work them up kind of how to do that. Um, and I'll probably model a lot of this after the way that I've done a lot of my work with Walk This Way, which has been pretty successful. Um, and one of my things that I like to do, again, kind of coming from a, a youth development asset-based um, mindset, is I really love to connect young folks to a larger framework because I think they then, um, the work resonates with them differently, right? I think it's really easy for you to be like, oh, okay, I have to walk around this street today. But if you kind of get to see the data, you get to see the impact you get. I say to folks all the time, like, you know, Bill and folks like Sally um, have been phenomenal in coming and meeting with my students. The vice chancellor has come into some other meetings with my other student staff. And, you know, and then they kind of see like, wow, this is part of this other really big thing. Because I think even when we think of like, we're in a pandemic, that's a really large kind of overwhelming thing, right? So then when you think, okay, what are actionable steps that we can do in that way? Um, so typically what I do is, and we have to, again, get creative about this because we can't have 20 plus people in a, in a room because we have to be cognizant of social distancing. Um, I generally will put in a one, a one time a month um, kind of staff development um, professional development for my staff when I work with them so they can have those takeaway skills. Um, and then one of the things that we do is at the end of each shift for an ambassador, they complete a fairly detailed, um, it's kind of like a Google form um, on their phone. And that includes sort of data collection. And we're actually going to be refining that this week to kind of include more data that we're, we're looking to get. Um, but it also includes questions about um, more qualitative data, but questions around what are some of the interactions, both negative and positive, that you've had in the community? Um, you know, we've been really great and really fortunate with um, feedback and help from support from the police. So we ask about that. Um, and then there's also a space where um, ambassadors can sort of tell me if there's any reoccurring questions that come up on shifts. Um, and so then that allows me, I review that data each week. Um, and then I send that up to Captain Ting, to Bill, um, to Paul and, and the chief of police. And so that allows us then on a weekly and a daily basis to sort of know, okay, what other training or what other supports do our, do our staff need? Um, and there's specifically a follow-up question around any support that I or the PD or folks can, can do. Um, and, you know, and we'll do a lot of different, um, you know, I come, I come from youth development, so I got a lot of skills, a lot of, a lot of tricks up my sleeve that I'm really excited to to do in different ways with folks. Um, and also using the ambassadors themselves. Um, we have a lot of folks, for example, um, I have an ambassador who's doing census work right now um, and is really, you know, and hearing how he articulates the importance of this work and why it matters and things like that. And a lot of our new ambassadors were like, wow, he's really good at this. And so then we said, okay, can you pair that up? And we started sort of a, a mentoring system, um, you know, and in and, and different ways in, in that regard. So um, we have some folks who are retired teachers that are applicants that I'm excited to see how they can kind of use, you know, pedagogy and approaches and, uh, and scaffolding different things for training folks. So I think there's a lot of resources right in our own community in that regard.
Well, Paul and I are excited for our shadow shift at three o'clock today. <laughs> so we, we just have to get our t-shirts on and we're excited to, to see how, um, how all the wonderful things you're describing play out in, in, in our community. So thank Yay, you for we're that. We're super excited to be joining. Uh, one of the things, uh, Jeff Lee had, was in before and said, oh, the UMass site hadn't been updated for, for several days. And I just checked and it has, it was updated at 1 a.m. this morning. So I think sometimes, you know, I had to refresh my browser because I had I had a few day old thing because I don't check it every day like you do, Kat. Um, so just wanted to clarify that for folks that they do update their, uh, that dashboard that, that every day, so. And sometimes I in the middle computer, of the night. Yes. Yeah. I think my computer just goes into protest mode because they're like, you've been on Zoom for seven hours today. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, we lost Winston. Winston's now under the desk chewing ah. on his stuff. Oh. So I, I do want to remind folks that we, um, we do have some more time for questions, live questions, or um, pop into the, the Q&A function. So feel free to use that. Um, over the next few minutes. I think, I think most of the questions that I've had submitted, we, we tackled. Um, to, I wanna give you guys the chance to say things that ha you haven't been asked. So Kat or Bill, are there anything related to your work that you wanna share that you haven't specifically been prompted to, to talk about yet? And I'll, uh, I'll hold off one second because I do have a question from the room and that takes priority. Yes. Um, Hi, my name is Marissa and I am a campus organizer with MassPerg students at UMass Amherst and I wanted to know if the program does any voter education outreach for students similar to the census work. Hmm. Great question, Marissa. Thank you. I'm going to put that to the, the folks in the room. Sure. So I will say as of right now, we have not done that, um, but I love to partner with folks. Um, so we, I think, can get really creative, Marissa, around, um, you know, tabling or ways like definitely come and talk to us. Right now, our main thing, um, you know, and I realized this when I was interviewing applicants and I would introduce the ambassador and I said, he's been with us for about two and a half weeks and I've been with us for about three weeks. Um, so I think, um, you know, this program is still, I want to name and acknowledge that it's still really in its, in, in its infancy. Um, but you know, there's a lot of, you know, conversation that we're having about ways that it grows, ways that it's connected to the community, things like that. Um, so definitely, um, I don't know if I can kind of drop my email in the chat or how to do that, but I would welcome, you know, hearing more um, for how we can partner. Because as we've seen in this work, we're as strong as our partnerships, you know? I don't know, Bill, if you want to respond to that too. Yeah, I can tell you, honestly, it hasn't even crossed my mind how we could make that connection, but if there's a person that could do it, Kat is certainly the one with the uh, the energy and the drive. And again, I'm just here to support her in using what knowledge I have over the course of my time here in Amherst to make her be most successful in her role. But you know, it, it's a really good point, um, Marissa, because it, that's a high priority for the town as well, is not just voter registration, getting everyone who's eligible vote to vote, but educating people about the ways you vote. There's lots of different pathways to voting. You can do early voting, you can do mail-in voting, you can vote on election day. So I think that's a, and that's a, one of our highest priorities for the fall. So I think connecting with the ambassadors is a brilliant idea. We should connect you with our town clerk as well. Um, yeah, and I think we can we can do a lot of education, Marissa, around how to vote safely, right, and how to mm -hmm. stay safe when you're voting, because I think that's a, a barrier for a lot of folks, and especially for folks that are maybe immunocompromised or that, you know, have hesitations about certain methods or things like that. So I think that if we can, I think we can definitely, um, you know, chat and maybe if that's, you know, coming up with some informational pamphlets or chops or tabling or, you know, coming around with us or, you know, different things like we can, we can definitely look into that. So. And I did just send Marissa, I sent you Kat's email. Um, oh, thank you. So hopefully you guys can get connected, but also the town clerk, as Paul mentioned, um, we we're hoping to do a specific push to students around some of the options and registration. So um, you can also be in touch with the town clerk, town clerk at amherstma.gov. So I do see um, a hand from someone who doesn't have a name, but there's some numbers. So I'm going to ask you to please introduce yourself. Uh, good morning. This is Phyllis Lehrer. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Amherst, and we do have a website. There's lots of voting information on that, and I would suggest people to do that. And thank you to the 
uh, volunteers uh, for your uh, ambassador program. I think that's wonderful. And everybody loves the dog. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, Bill. Uh, but You're that's, welcome. Uh, and uh, I don't know if your ambassadors could mention that the last day to register to vote is October 30th or something like that. So, but thank you for doing that. And thank you for uh, letting us all speak to you. Bye. Bye thank Phyllis. you, Phyllis. Bye. Nice to hear from you. Okay. So one of the things I want to, maybe Bill can um, talk about, one of the things that I don't think the public really knows that how the town and the university work together on um, just general things. So um, every Monday, there's a meeting called the on-call meeting. And this includes uh, people from the fire department, the Amherst Fire Department, Amherst Police Department, UMass Police Department, uh, uh, other officials from UMass. And basic and inspection services, and they all get together and go over the weekends. What happened over the weekend? They look at all the calls that came into AP, the, the the dispatch at, at the police department, and the people on the ground sort of go through them and see: Are we looking at trends? Are we? Um, are who's what kind of follow up do we need to do on these things? Do you want to talk a little bit about that, Bill? Because it's a really impressive partnership that happens very every week and includes all the right people in the room at the same time. Sure. Yeah. So th this this has been in an existence for many many years. I really think it's gained strength over the last mm -hmm. couple of years. And as Paul said, it's an opportunity to share information. We look at you know trends we're seeing in terms of behavior. We look at comparisons of calls compared, like yearly comparisons. So there were 200 calls this year. There were 150 last year. Um, and that is done both by us, the fire department, UMass PD. Uh, and then of course, our code enforcement team is there. So they'll discuss, you know, complaints they've received. Again, it could be overpopulation, it could be sanitation, whatever the case may be. The UMass Dean of Students is there. So we'll make referrals to them about behavioral issues we're seeing. It could be something where enforcement action has taken. It could be something about a concern we have over someone's mental health. We'll make a referral through them. And the meeting is really just the beginning. That kind of sets the tone for the week. And then we're taking that information and, you know, we're in communication with UMass daily. And it's sometimes multiple times a day at 10 o'clock. I'm connecting with Tony Maroulis, we're going to meet with a property manager who has some concerns about some activity out of, at her, her, her property that she manages. Uh, yeah, it's, it's ongoing. I would just want, you know, sometimes a lot of what I've heard this year is about what is, what is the community and what is UMass doing about this. And when we have the opportunity to speak with people or connect, I'm a big, I like to connect with people in person. So one thing that I've done to kind of circumvent this COVID issue and social distancing is when I when I want to connect with students or I want to connect with somebody from UMass, I'll propose let's meet at the Mill River Rec Pavilion. You know, we can socially distance. I just like the face-to-face -face interaction. We can really get down to the nuts and bolts of what the problem is and what are we going to use to provide a solution to the problem. So when we do our outreach, you know, a lot of the same people that are in that room during our on-call are the folks that come with us doing community outreach. And with that said, I just had a conversation with a woman yesterday up in North Amherst, and I encouraged her, you are welcome at any time, and this goes to anybody, to come out and do community outreach with us. It gives you an opportunity to see what we're doing. It also gives you an opportunity to evaluate what we're doing and critique it, and maybe provide us some solutions how to do our, our work better. Because, again, it's just... A, it's a collection of thought and action by a group of pretty talented people. And thankfully we all get along, which helps it, you know, our relationship extends beyond, you know, when I leave at four o'clock, it doesn't mean I don't communicate with these people. I have friendships with them. So it's been really good. And I think that that helps. But again, if, if you ever want to come out, just connect with me, we'd be happy to take you. We do a lot of outreach and I think it, it reassures our community that, that you know, we are, dealing with this and again it's there is a admittedly there is a learning curve for all of us in this it changes daily the information changes so we're just kind of being as pliable as we can and responding to the needs of the community to make everyone feel safe 
Thank you, Bill. I, I do see a hand from Nathan and Pearl. So Nathan and or Pearl, please unmute and introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. This is Pearl and Marguerite. I'm sorry I joined late, but I see Kat is smiling and Hi, Bill is probably taking care of our beloved town mascot that the whole of the <laughs> Grandwood area, this is for, these kisses are for Winston. Um, <laughs> over the past few years, um, we, we in our entire neighborhood have become quite... Um, frequent uh, um, partners with Bill and Tony and Kat and Sally and I can't thank you all enough for for being such valuable partners to our community and um, Nathan and I had that wonderful opportunity to actually go for a neighborhood walk and we were very very impressed with um, Joey and Fana, I can't quite, the so student that, yeah. who's, it was yeah. her maiden trip in the neighborhood and when she knocked on the student's house, she was just so proud and kind of a bit anxious and saying that was my first visit and, you know, the interaction went well. And I think certainly from, you know, all these different partnerships, um, you know, I just wish everybody a lot of success because I'm enormously and so all of all of us in the neighborhood impressed with what you what you've done and uh, trying to you know keep the entire community safe and respectful of each other and we recognize particularly in a family neighborhood it's kind of difficult at times because you're living with people who you know have who've come of age in terms of their own freedom and not necessarily complying to the to the norms and mores of a community so and and then lastly i need to just thank bill as well because at the last moment he came on a invitation to walk around um, grantwood drive when the students went back to school um, so it was a wildwood school event he came with winston and uh, Officer Mike came to keep us all safe in the street. And that was just, just a wonderful, wonderful way of community policing interactions. And everybody was speaking about it for days after. So thank you to all of you. We really appreciate what you're doing. And, and we wish all lots of success in keeping us all healthy. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Perlian. It's so fun to always work with you. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Kat, really. Thank you, Perlian. Hey, okay. So we're, we're coming up to, to our hour. So I'm just going to give a last call for questions. Um, use our Q&A function, raise your hand, or press star nine for those of you joining from the phone. Um, with that being said, I'm going to give our special guests a chance to wrap up any thoughts or comments that they didn't get a chance to share yet, um, as well as the town manager. And if nobody has anything to say, I am going to make a plug for answering your census. Um, probably everybody on this call has done that, but please ask your friends and your neighbors, um, anybody that you come across, please remind them to answer their census by the end of the month. Yeah, we're in crunch time on the census and we really need people to be uh, connecting with folks. Um, and it's, it should be the first thing when you see someone you say, hey, just do your census yet. And it, it really is 10 minutes, but it, mat it matters a whole lot to us. Um, so. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I'll just close by, um, by just saying thank you. Like, I mean, I got connected to this work through Bill and through UMass and things like that. And it was, you know, working under Sally's office was one of the most rewarding parts of my, my graduate experience. And I just feel like very, very blessed and privileged to be doing this work and, um, and doing it in the ways that I'm doing it. And I, I genuinely like, you know, I wake up and I look forward to work every single day. And I love to hear from my, you know, my young folks, I love to hear from all of my staff, things like that. And I'm really, really excited to see sort of where this program goes. And I just want to echo a, 
you know, just profound appreciation to, to you, Paul, for your support. And Brianna, we've been trying to connect and I'm always all over the place as I'm starting to get things off the ground and just, you know, with Chief Livingston and, and um, you know, the sergeants on, on shift and, and Bill and, and Gabe and everyone, like, it's just been, it's been really wonderful to like start this position and know that I have a lot of support and that I can ask questions and, you know, I'm, I'm new to this role. So definitely give me feedback. I, I love feedback and learning and fine tuning systems and things like that. So um, excited to learn, but really just feeling just very privileged to be doing this work at this time and in this context. So thank you. Well, we appreciate you coming on board and your energy and enthusiasm is, is contagious. So I'm looking forward mm -hmm. to, we're all looking forward to working with you in this and other ways as, as we move forward. Um, so thank you for that. Paul, Bill, any, any final, um, any final words before we, we wrap? I, I do want to just mention to the caller, uh, the attendees that we will record this um, and it's going to be posted shortly after the meeting in case you want to go back and revisit any comments or just stare into Winston's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> They're open. I have to say thank you for hosting us. I think this is a great opportunity to connect with the community in non-traditional ways and for them to understand that, you know, all of us are out there working really hard day in and day out. The connection with UMass is as strong as ever. Uh, if there's anything you need, if you need a Winston kiss, email <laughs> me. I'm his agent. I'm happy to do that. Uh, but yeah, again, thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Yep. And a nice weekend. Yeah, Thanks, happy. everybody. And, and the, the, I'll finish with um, just putting it, this out this to the room or the people who are going to be viewing this later. If you have a, a question or concern related to COVID, you can email us at covidconcerns at amherstma.gov or you can call us at 413-259-2425. So thank you all for joining us and a special thanks to Winston for um, gracing us mm -hmm. with your presence. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.